Don't be fooled by the accent, he's just a good old country boy teaching in Bristol. Raising some chickens, studying hamsters, and never dating girls wearing crystals. I'm telling y'all he's a country boy who loves his mama good. Like Batman's got his Robin, like Doritos are health food. I'd tell you more if time allowed, I swear I really would. So let me introduce to you the one and only Bruce Hood. Thank you. That was worth traveling 3,000 miles, so I assure you. Fantastic. Well, it looks like we're in business here. Um, I hope uh, you've got some image in front of you, and if not, I'll just... Okay. Way! Hey. It is Friday the 13th, after all. Um, so, uh... It's great to be back here. Uh, two years ago, I talked about uh, my first book, Super Sense. It was all about the way the brain creates these illusions that there are patterns and energies operating in the world, and you can understand that this is the basis for supernatural belief. So, you know, this would have been a good day to return to that. But today, I wanted to tell you about a different type of an illusion, one which is actually more pervasive because it's an illusion shared by believers and non believers alike, uh, and that is the self illusion. This idea that we're integrated, coherent individuals uh, who are inside our bodies, somehow operating it almost like a puppet master with kind of coherent thoughts and processes. Uh, I'm going to claim that that sense of the self is, is not what it seems to most of us. Um, so what do you mean by the self? Well, if I was to say to you, um, do you like vanilla or do you like chocolate ice cream? You have a sense of the self of hearing a question, contemplating an answer, and then formulating some, some response. Now that's the sense of the self in uh, conscious moment awareness. That's what William James would call the I sense of the self. Um, but of course, to answer that question, you have to draw upon all the experiences that you've had you know, when you've last eaten ice cream. Uh, and that, of course, is a legacy of all the experiences and influences and past events. Uh, and if I was to meet you in the bar and say, tell me about yourself, you would say, well, I was born wherever, and I have this as a job, and this is what I do, and this is what I want to do for the future. These are all sorts of bits of information, which are what we call the personal identity of self. So William James called that the me. So both the I and the me are facets of the self, but I think they're both constructed by the brain. I'm not denying people have events and uh, experiences, of, of course, but I, I would argue that the brain abstracts these and, and weaves these together into a coherence, a, a coherent characterization of, of identity. And certainly the idea that um, it's an illusion, don't, that doesn't mean it's not real. An illusion means that it's not what it seems. Um, and we should be wary. I'm not denying you're having an experience. What I'm trying to say is that the experience of the self is, is, is very different. And we should uh, be reminded by um, this from a classic film, um, if you pop that up there. Uh, I'm sure most of the geeks in this audience will well recognize this masterpiece of science fiction. No. no slides, nothing. You haven't, oh, that's a shame. You missed the soundtrack as well. Oh, I went to all that effort. Never mind. Uh, shall I do it again? It's a pretty cool soundtrack. Okay, here we go. Let's try again. Yeah, cool. Um, there's lots of leather and dark glasses. It was always going to be a winner, wasn't it? Now, the thing about Neo is, of course, he thinks that he's a computer programmer, but we know that he, like the rest of the civilization, has been enslaved by the sentient computers. Uh, to harvest them for their biochemical energy. Uh, and the way they keep them enslaved is they feed directly into their brains a simulation, this, this, this matrix, um, so that they never know. Now, of course, it's science fiction, but the principle that if you could ever control the, the, the working of the brain, then you would effectively control the mind is, is one which I think is, is worth exploring. Because I have to think that we, we're not living in the matrix as such, but we are simulating the external world the whole time and I also think we're simulating an internal uh, character to interact with that world. So for example, um, at the moment you've got this very rich experience of seeing me wave my hands and you've got all this detail of this amazing visual field, but in fact you're only processing a small part of it, you're only really processing the central part of your visual field. Uh, it's colorblind and smeared in the periphery of your vision. You've got two black holes, uh, you know, which correspond to the blind spots. Uh, portions of the retina with our own photoreceptors, and yet your brain fills that in all the time, very reliably, you just would never know. Now, of course, you can move your eyes all the time 
to look around and investigate the world. But every time you move your eyes, your visual scene is literally blanking off. You're, you're actually blind every time you move your eyes. If you don't believe me, uh, go to the restroom after the talk and have a look in the mirror and then stare at your left eye and then your right eye and then your left eye and you can't see your own eye movements. You're effectively blind for two and a half hours of every waking day. But you would never know that because your brain creates this, this simulation. It's all filled in, it all just seems rich, continuous and coherent. But that's not true. Now, I also think that there's a multitude of unconscious processes which are really at the basis of our thoughts and behaviors, but we simulate this character, the individual, to try and keep track of all the multitude to give it a sense of coherence. So that's what I think the self is. I think it's a sort of serial interface, if you like, between the complexity of the world out there and, and the multitude of all the unconscious processes. So how does this happen? Well, how does this get created? This is, this is me, by the way. This is my brain. I had an image in one of our studies a couple of years ago. Everything that I am, my anxieties speaking to all you people, and my thoughts and my memories, somehow are encoded and stored in this three pound lump of tissue. But of course, um, I didn't pop out of my mother's womb as Bruce. Uh, that would have been a bit strange. I had to become, I had to develop into Bruce. And so there's a developmental process. Of how does that happen? Well, um, you're all familiar now, the brain is made up of vast networks of billions of neurons and they all communicate with each other through these electrical impulses. And that information is <coughs> interpreted, coded into these synchronized patterns that we are basically representations of the external world or representations. Representations are, are the language of, of, of the brain. And even thoughts and memories that you dwell upon or bring to consciousness are representation systems. So how do those representations get there? Well, I think some are built in, but a lot of them are acquired through experience. So this is my interest, by the way. I'm a developmental neuroscientist. Uh, the baby brain is a lot smaller, but what you may not appreciate, it actually has more or less the full complement of neurons as an adult, around about 86 billion. But what is changing, of course, is the connectivity between those neurons. Um, basically, there are two processes. There's a very rapid explosion of connectivity, uh, this sort of progressive uh, wiring up, generation of synapses. But uh, there's equally a degeneration or pruning back of experience. And the reason this happens, it's a way that the environment can literally shape the brain. Because you don't want to keep connections which are never going to be lost, uh, never going to be used. And in this way, you know, the brain is literally being shaped. And this has some interesting consequences. For example, you know that every child has the capability to learn language. If they're born of Japanese parents and raised in the US, they will easily, effortlessly acquire, acquire English. But in, inquiring, in, a, in developing expertise, you become tuned in to your particular environment and lose the capability and flexibility of hearing and perceiving other aspects. So this explains, for example, why it's often difficult to hear the differences in other languages. Um, we can test this out. Uh, let's have a go. Let's see how good you are with Hindi. So I want you to listen very carefully, and uh, you'll hear two segments of Hindi. You know, this is audience participation, by the way, uh, time. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if you think they're the same or different. I'll prompt you, by the way. So pay, pay attention. Let's get the sound up on this. You ready? Tuck. Tuck. Hands up if you think they're different. Hands up if you think they're the same. Yep, they're, they're different. One's a word, and one's a complete non-word, apparently. Here's another example. Dull, dull. Different? You got it? Ah, oh, you get it. You learn handy fast. Um, yeah, they actually are different. In general, though, it's very, very hard to tell these sorts of things. It's not just sounds and voices, it's also faces. We are wiring in and tuning into the environment. The next one's a really good example. I used this last time I talked, but it's such a, it, it makes a couple of really interesting points. So um, this is the McGurk effect. So watch carefully and see, uh, tell me what you think he's saying. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, ba. Hands up if you heard da, 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 da. Pretty reliable. You probably put money on it. Okay. This time, close your eyes and listen carefully. You ready? Ba, 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 ba. Aha, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, he's saying ba, ba. He's not saying da, da at all. Um, why do you hear that? Well, it's because, actually, what we've done is we've cheated a little bit. We're using, he's mouthing ga, ga, okay? So that shape of that visual information, you don't have any representation in your brain for that shape of mouth and that sound. So your brain basically comes up with a solution to make sense of this incompatible information. So you don't have any direct contact with reality. Your brain is giving that to you all the time, trying to make sense of the world of ambiguity and missing information. Now, um, these examples typically have been talked about in the, in the realms of perception, you know, low level vision, voices, stuff like that. 
But we're increasingly coming to understand that the brain um, is really a social brain and, and it's really important to have very, important, very enriched social environments. Now you can't do these sorts of deprivation, deprivation studies uh, ethically with children, but every so often you do get these examples where children have been raised in terrible conditions of social deprivation. Um, the most uh, scientifically studied example of this was the fall of the uh, uh, Ceausescu's re re uh, regime, the Romanian orphans, uh, uh, and they were basically children who had been dumped by their parents who couldn't look after them, so they had the food and the water, but they were kept in isolation. And uh, they were then taken out and uh, raised in very uh, nurturing environments. But the point was, despite that intervention, these children still ended up with very severe uh, deprivation, and they're now adults, and they're, they're, they have social problems in many ways. We should have known that anyway, because the work of Harry Harlow in the 60s had shown that it's really important to raise, uh, to get a social environment. He raised uh, rhesus monkeys, gave them all the food and warmth and the water that they could need, but just left them isolated, and they ended up um, socially retarded. Normally, an environment is pretty good. So childhood, uh, you know, children just love other, <laughs> other people. You know, that's what they do. Uh, you know, my, I thought, for example, with, you know, faces are just like magnets to babies. They love other people. They pay. That's the most important stimulus to a child. It's not a toy or anything. It's, it's other people. This is what our brains have evolved to do. And we will emulate and copy. And in fact, a lot of the learning really lo only makes sense in the social context. Uh, I love this next one, actually. This is a, this is a European MP who took her daughter to a, a very important vote in the uh, European Parliament. Uh, I don't know if she got the extra vote there, but anyway, you know, we emulate and, and copy our parents. Uh, and this is what we do to become this strange race. Uh, I, what was it, uh, DJ Grothy called us the social primates? Well, you know, we congregate, we spend a large amount of time uh, doing things which, if you were an alien from another planet, would look really bizarre. We, you know, we need other people. I mean, there are some of us who don't, you know, who are isolates and try to keep away, but for the majority of us, we spend an enormous amount of time becoming a social animal. So how do we do that? Well. We have to develop a sense of the self because I don't think we're like super social species like ants and, and bees and that. I think that we are, we are a very social animal, but we're a, a collections of cells because we need to integrate or interact at an individual uh, basis. We, we don't I interact with multitudes of unconscious processes. So how does that come about? Well, the sense of self, I think, is, is developed. Uh, there, I think babies probably have that eye notion of the momentary consciousness, I think that's probably there, but I don't think they have personal identity. I mean, how could they? Uh, that's something which I think they, they pick up over the early childhood years. So for example, self-recognition, uh, they don't generally recognize themselves in the mirror. There's a famous rouge test, if you put a bit of makeup on their nose, they'll just stare at the baby in the mirror and laugh and giggle, it's just another baby. But uh, you know, from about 18 months onwards, they'll, they'll remove it. Indeed, other animals, which are social animals, also pass this task. So uh, there's some controversy about exactly what this test means, but I think you know, they're certainly becoming self-conscious, aware of others around them, looking at them. They start to pick up identity. Some of the early uh, identity markers are things like boys do this, girls do that. Children at this age are very kind of categorical. They don't have very nuanced ideas. And it's only as they get older they understand their ex exceptions to the rules. Uh, they acquire what we call, uh, psychologists call a theory of mind. They understand that others have mental states which might be different to their own because prior to that they're fairly egotistic. They just assume everyone has the same thoughts as they do. Uh, and then throughout this period there's this increasing concern about where they are in the pecking order. This is the development of self-esteem. Um, you know, they're starting to interact with their peer groups. They're starting to be worried about where they are. Um, and of course, a lot of childhood is, is focused on this concern about where they, are, where they are in the pecking order. The worst thing is being ostracized, bullying. Uh, then we have the teenage years uh, in an attempt to, to establish yourself, get your own identity separate to your parents, uh, finding oneself. That's what the teenage years are all about. And of course, the irony is that everyone turns into their parents in their mid-20s. <laughs> well, um, so this is, this is what happens. Now, along with this, um, this goes back to my first book on, on, um, on supernatural beliefs because I think this growing sentience, this growing self-awareness um, also fits with the idea of, of uh, mind-body dualism, which is, I think, the most common position that people assume. When you ask them about the mind and the body, they think that they're separate, that we inhabit our bodies. These are vessels which we kind of uh, ride around and we control them, and, you know, and they let us down. You know, occasionally we say, oh, my leg's given out or something like that. We, we feel that we are separate to our bodies. You know, we, we face the mirror on a kind of daily basis. We see the, the, pro, the ravages of age and we see our external appearance changing 
but we feel internally that we still have continuity. So I think there is this tendency to assume that we are inhabiting our bodies um, and that we move with our bodies somehow. And this is a, uh, there was some discussion of this idea today about the idea of, of duplication and uh, I, I just fiddled around with keynotes, so please indulge me. Here we go. That was worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I'm a bit of a geek. Um, so, the, so the idea is that you know, we never really questioned about the mind and the body being separate. It, it, uh, you know, it, it's only when you're faced with these unusual thought experiments. What happens if it malfunctions in episode five? I'm sure there's some star kicked in. You do remember that episode five? Yeah, you're out there. <laughs> you can't hide. Yeah, episode five, we had James T. Kirk duplicated. Um, I prefer actually this film. If you haven't seen it, you really should see it. It's a classic. Cla uh, Chris Nolan, Batman director. This is the film, The Prestige, about two Victorian dueling magicians, okay? And uh, one of the protagonists, uh, Hugh Jackman, um, meets up with a real life Nicholas Tesla. Um, who builds them this duplicating machine. I won't give the plot away because it's a great film, but basically he copies himself. And the question is, if you could really build a machine which duplicates down to the molecular level, then would the mind be duplicated? I mean, Michael Shermer mentioned this this morning. It's a familiar thought experiment that philosophers talk about. Um, and most people think that you couldn't. They think their mind is indivisible. Their mind is unique. Their mind is something which can't be copied. Uh, and I think that's a very common intuition, but where does it come from? Well, we started to, uh, as I say, I work with children. Uh, we wanted to know about this, and we, we talked to six-year-olds, and it's very difficult to discuss thought experiments with six-year-olds. But what you can do is you can actually kind of give them a, an example. And this is how we create the duplication scenario. So this is how it goes. Here's Mr. Strong. See how nice and squishy he is. I'm going to put Mr. Strong in this box like that. And I'm going to close up the box. Close up that. Make sure my machine's turned on. And then turn it to green. Turn this one to green as well. And press go. Let's see what happens. So here, there's Mr. Strong. Let's open this box as well. Ah, oh, amazing, happened? huh? Uh, yeah, it's not exactly James Randi, but it's a, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to give up the day job, put it that way. Um, so children think, you know, say, what's, got, what's happening here? And they think it's a duplicating machine, just like a photocopier. Why wouldn't they? You know, uh, and we show them lots and lots of examples of every toy being copied, and they believe this. But the real question of interest is, what happens if you put a living thing in there? Now, obviously, the box is a little bit too small to put a person in there. So what we did was uh, we had the pet hamster. Um, and uh, we told them, and by the way, this is work is coming out next month, so I'm quite excited about it. I've been talking about this for some time, and it was never peer-reviewed, and uh, now it is, and it's coming out in a good journal. But here's what we found. The long and the short of the story is that we told them that we had this hamster, which had uh, physical properties that they couldn't see. It had a marble in the tummy and a broken tooth. And then we gave it some mental states. So we told the hamster the child's name, and we showed it a picture the child had drawn. And then we put it into the machine and then duplicated it. And now there are two hamsters, and the child's asked, well, does it know your name? Does it uh, you know, have a marble in its stomach? And the bottom line was they basically were quite happy that all the physical properties were copied. So there wasn't a problem with that. But they were very reluctant to think that the mental states were also copied. That was only um, found in the first hamster. In fact, the effect was even stronger if you gave the first hamster a name by calling it Bob. Okay, so once you have identified an individual, then along with that comes a whole lot of baggage about unique minds being inseparable. We're quite happy to believe that, you know, simple animals without minds like aphids, in fact, aphids are clones, but, you know, simple animals can be duplicated. But the idea of sentient uh, and sentience and, and minds is something which we don't believe can be manipulated or copied in that way. So where is this uh, self? Well, let's think back to the, the discussion of the I self, the, the, the sense of the conscious awareness at the point in time. Uh, if you get people to uh, just you know, try and uh, meditate and then point to where they feel their seat of consciousness is, this is generally where they think they are. This is based on uh, another study by other people. And you, you think you exist somewhere inside your head sitting behind your eyes. But there can't be a little pe person you know, sitting in your head behind your eyes. Um, because uh, <laughs> that wouldn't make a lot of sense because if 
you know, they're inside your head, um, you know, who's inside their head, and their head, and their head, and so on. So you get into the problem with homunculus, so that's the infinite regress. That's why you can't have the unified self inside your head. This is probably a little bit more accurate. Um, as you can see, I, I use a lot of popular culture when I'm doing my science. This is uh, the numbskulls, um, and this is a guy called Ed, and he has all these little people. Now clearly, you haven't got lots of little people in your head, and, and even if you did, you still have the problem of homunculus. Uh, but it is true to think about the mind as being comprised of lots of, a multitude of functions that somehow uh, come together to form a coherent sense of self. Uh, and, and I think that the evidence strongly supports this. Uh, this is the work of Roger Sperry, the Nobel Prize winner, and his student at the time was Michael Gazanaga. And they were doing work with these patients with intractable epilepsy. And one of the treatments for that is to cut those connections, I was telling you about the corpus callosum, to separate the hemispheres. It stops the uh, epilepsy uh, spreading. Um, now, the consequence of that is because uh, the way that your sensory and motor systems are organized, the left part of your field is processed by the right side of your brain, and, and the right part of the visual field and motor control is processed by the left hemisphere. What you can do, and this is what Gazanaga did, is you can present these split brain patients with information which is inconsistent in both hemispheres. So in this situation, for example, you get them to fix, fixate the middle spot, and say what they see on the screen. Now, language is predominantly in the left hemisphere, and they would respond, oh, it's a ring. Uh, and then you say, well, will your left hand pick up the object from the table? Uh, but because that's processed in the right side, which controls the left hand, they would then pick up the key. And when they're confronted with this inconsistency, what they typically do is they confabulate an account, a story which makes sense of all the incon incoherent information. And I think that's what is going on. I think the brain is creating a, has a multitude of unconscious influences which are somehow having to be reconciled. Uh, I think Steven Pinker captured that with the notion of the I consciousness, when he said consciousness isn't the master in chief, it's the spin doctor of experience. So I think that that's what's going on. You're basically trying to co create a coherent picture. And this also goes for those memories. You know, everyone thinks their memory is very reliable. Uh, John Locke, the philosopher, talked about identity as the culmination of episodic memories somehow being brought together. Um, but of course, memories are not that reliable, and they're always being reinterpreted, reintegrated with new information. And m our next speaker, uh, uh, Carol uh, Tavris, is, is among some of the world's authorities on the way that we reinterpret information to fit with this characterization of who we think we are. We have this notion of an idealized notion of ourself, and uh, you know, when we don't do things according to that character, you say, I wasn't myself. Uh, or it was the wine talking. You know, well, wine doesn't talk, and if you weren't yourself, then where were you? So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's true. You must be this culmination of factors. And again, if you think back over the history of social psychology, this notion that we are individuals um, is, is always challenged by the fact that we just are so manipulable and, and sensitive to the cultural context uh, and the social context. So obedience, Ash's work. Uh, you know, most people would actually administer a lethal, uh, you know, electric shock, although most people claim they wouldn't. This is Milgram's work. Uh, you know, if you arbitrarily set people up into different groups, they have in-group, out-group biases, start treating the other group you know, nasty. And of course, all this work kind of leads to this sort of explanations for why people do incredibly inhumane things to other people. So the idealized notion of who we are is, is somewhat questionable. So our brain is a social brain, and from the very beginning, I think it's one which is very much geared towards other people and influenced by, by other people. But, you know, it, don't worry about this idea of the illusion, because I think people are concerned, well, illusions means it's not there. But if you consider this illusion, this is the Knizia illusion, you know, you see a square, but it's, of course, an emergent property of everything there. But here's the important point. If you went into the brain, to the visual processing areas, you would find assemblies of cells which are firing as if the square really is there. So uh, although it's an illusion, in terms of the representation, it's effectively there. In the same way, I think the characterization of the self is one which is an emergent property of all the influences which have shaped you over your life. But you'd be foolish to think that you exist independently of them. In the same way, you'd be foolish to think that the square exists independently. Now, I went through that talk rather fast. You might be wondering, you know, is he on speed or drugs? No, um, the reason I went through that fast is because I, um, I decided to change the end of the talk. Um, I got a phone call on Wednesday night, and I know you've already heard about this. But it's such an important issue, and I was, had a small role in it. I just wanted to remind you and show you maybe some of the stuff you didn't see about why this is so important. I'm, I'm talking about uh, the, the bomb dowsing thing that I was involved in uh, some you know, three years ago. Uh, you may not know, but James Ramney in 2008 was responsible for having the guys who perfected this dowsing rod. This is this piece of equipment that they claim could discover 
um, you know, drugs and explosives. The SNFX that were put out of business, where did they go? They went to the UK. They started up again, a whole bunch of companies. We had the GT200, the ADE 651. Um, and I would not have known about any of this if it wasn't for the fact the New York Times published a um, expose on, the, or published a report showing the Iraqi government had spent $85 million investing in these devices to be used at checkpoints rather than doing the proper thing which was to thoroughly search the cars for the, for the bombers. The consequence was that hundreds of people were losing their lives. Now I'm an academic, I'm not an activist normally, and I wouldn't have done anything about this, but it turns out that the company was just down the road from me, and the, and, and the director, Jim McCormick, uh, was there. So I blogged about it and said, you know, this is disgraceful, uh, we've got to write to MPs, we've got to do something, this is really outrageous, there's just simply no science for this. And to my great surprise, Jim McCormick, maybe it was the fact that I was an academic and he was seeking some validation, wrote back to me and invited me to come down and we were going to test it. And I thought this was an opportunity which was too good to miss. So I, I, got, the, uh, B, I got in touch with the BBC and we did a sting operation because we wanted to uh, expose Jim McCormick at the time. And this is a little bit of what we did. Good evening. A Newsnight investigation has discovered that a supposed bomb detector produced by a British company and sold for use in Iraq simply does not work. Following our revelations, the government is to ban their export to Iraq and Afghanistan. The Iraqi government has spent $85 million on the devices, which have been widely used, and there are concerns that the detectors have failed to stop bomb attacks that have killed hundreds of people. There are some disturbing images in Caroline Hawley's exclusive report. Yes, see? Jim McCormick may be hiding from the cameras here in the UK, but he did appear at a press conference in Baghdad after last month's bombs filmed by Iraqi television. He and this Iraqi security chief were trying to persuade local journalists that the detectors worked. The grenade the device is meant to detect is placed in full view of the operator. No surprise, it points at its target. It would be comic if the consequences weren't potentially so tragic. We brought the footage to show to Professor Bruce Hood. Okay, well, well I was on the, look, there, there's been a lot of people involved in this campaign. I, I was just involved in part of the TV show because basically this company had been given an export license by the British government, um, which was unbelievable. And they would have done nothing if it hadn't been for the fact that we went on to national television and broadcast that. The following day, he was arrested and an export order ban was issued for the sale of these items to Iraq and Afghanistan. Now. At that point, we thought that was, that was a major success. We then discovered that he was continuing to trade, as was GT200 and the other companies. In fact, trading to your neighbors, Mexico, where they have been buying uh, millions of dollars worth of these pieces of equipment. And I have to confess, I was pretty um, upset that, in fact, we may have lost the battle in the long run. Um, but then February this year, the police visited me and I gave a statement. And then I got this phone call on Wednesday night to tell me that, in fact, they now had sufficient evidence that Jim McCormick um, was actually going to face trial. And indeed, yesterday morning, he appeared in the High Court. And um, not only Jim McCormick, but all of them. Gary Bolton, the trees, Sam Trout, and Annie Rosen. And they're all probably likely to go down. The result of the case won't be probably until February. Uh, we're going to be working more with the BBC to do a proper uh, story about it. And I assure you, James Randi is definitely going to get credit for this. So thank you very much. One of ours. One of ours. Bruce Hood, ladies and gentlemen. Fantastic.